Nini, everyone. Mary here again. Sorry that it's been a while. Work has been pretty hectic, and uh, my schedule is not as open as it used to be. So I guess, you know, for the most part, I, I imagine most of you go through the same thing. And, you know, being, uh, it was like five months I was like out of, on a, I was not doing anything. I was, you know, after AmeriCorps and then getting into the job I'm working at now, you know. It's a wide gap, and you can forget how <laughs> how much work fills up your schedule. So, um, I haven't had a lot of free time to do um, you know side projects, especially you know something like this, and especially too, it's almost Astara and almost the Feast of Men in Renanutet. So I'm excited because for me, you know, those holidays, all of those. Uh, the beginning is the beginning of spring and so you know while other people are thinking you know the equinox with the light getting longer or um, you know beginning of new projects and different things like that you know more I guess cerebral kind of things it's like for me it's gardening gardening mm -hmm. um, I even bought a greenhouse and everything so <laughs> so I could grow things hooray um, but uh, in light of that, I guess uh, I wanted to get started on a, a new video project, or my first, you know, I guess video series. And uh, this is going to be about plants that the Egyptians use, you know, whether they, they held them sacred in a religious context, or, you know, they were important, maybe crop, or um, or, or for um, medicine, or anything like that. So, uh, uh, this is the first one. Um, and I'll have a little presentation following this little introduction. Um, and this one, the very first one, I think, uh, I decided was going to be about the Egyptian lotus. So, without further ado, um, here's my little presentation on the Egyptian lotus and what the Egyptians did with them. The Egyptian lotus was the showiest of all the flowers of ancient Egypt, so it's no surprise that it was so important to Egyptian culture and artwork. There are two different uh, species of Egyptian lotus, Nymphaea cerulea and Nymphaea lotus. These two flowers are actually water lilies and not related to true lotuses, those of the genus Nalumbo. Uh, these types of lotuses, these true lotuses, did not appear until 525 BCE. Nymphaea cerulea uh, has the common name of the Egyptian water lily. This is the one that most people see in Egyptian artwork. It's the one that has the really beautiful blue blooms. Their buds emerge and bloom during midday and they have notched an entire, which means very smooth, uh, floating leaves. They produce, of course, violet-blue blooms, and the seed pods and roots were once used as a food source. On the other hand, we have Nymphaea lotus, which is commonly called the Egyptian white lily. This one has wider and flatter blooms than the Egyptian water lily, and opened at dusk and open, stayed open throughout the night. And they have what's called dentate margins, which is the edge of the leaf, kind of has a toothy appearance. So they have a very stark contrast and it's very easy to tell one from the other. Not only were lotuses in ancient Egypt the showiest of that region, but they were also extremely common growing in uh, different areas such as canals, and they also bloomed year-round as opposed to other species of flowers that the Egyptians liked, such as poppies or cornflowers. The ancient Egyptians had very many uses for both species of lotus. It was very common to use it for decorative purposes. They were worn as hair ornaments or woven into broad collars, and they were made into bouquets, both as gifts and as room decor. They were also used very often times as perfume, as, you know, in ancient days, um, sanitation wasn't <laughs> what it is in the modern day, so um, they often used 
lotuses to mask bad odors, much as in the medieval times when people would have perfume-soaked handkerchiefs to sniff when they were going, say, past a trash pile or something. And obviously, both the flower and the oil was made for a personal perfume for, you know, scenting yourself. It was also very commonly used as a medicine. There are many remedies that use lotus for jaundice, constipation, hair loss, and fevers. Even one remedy has a, a person or a patient being submerged in a bath with lotus oil because it was believed to be very cooling. It was also very commonly used as a food. The root was eaten raw or cooked, but most often cooked, and the seeds were ground and used in making bread. Most people uh, recognized the lotus being used in spiritual matters. It was very important in different creation myths, uh, especially uh, if anyone recalls uh, Ra emerging from noon inside of a lotus. There was also the god Nefertum, the god of salves, healing, sweet fragrances, and he was de depicted often with a lotus on his head. Lotuses are often also used in rituals as offerings to deities, and also, too, as offerings to the dead. Since the Egyptian blue lotus was open during the day and the Egyptian white lotus was open during the night, we can often use those colors to determine when different rituals had taken place. There are some instances, especially with Nefertiti uh, conducting rituals, where she's holding a white lotus, which would mean that she would be conducting these rituals during the evening when the Egyptian white lotus was blooming. The two lotus species don't experience the same distribution that they used to in ancient Egypt. Over collection, and stable water levels in the Nile have created a lot of habitat loss, but they're still cultivated. In fact, the white lotus is actually naturalized in Louisiana and Florida. It's escaped cultivation and now grows in the wild. So I hope you've enjoyed this little presentation, and I wish you a good day, and thank you, and so Neptune.